Hello, everybody. Today we're talking to Luke Newman from Newman Films. This is episode 12. So, welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast. I am your host, Jason Buff. Welcome for another show. Glad you could join us today. Today we're going to be talking with Luke Newman of Newman Films. Now, if you don't know about Newman Films, just go to YouTube right now. Well, okay, after the podcast and check out all the tutorials and all the great content they have on their YouTube channel. You know, they were one of the first groups of people to really come out with a lot of high quality tutorials for DSLR filmmaking and, you know, everything from visual effects to, you know, whatever, but everything kind of DIY and and things that you can do on a low budget. So check that out. And, uh, you know, if you want to subscribe to this podcast that would be wonderful and leave us a review that would be even better if you like it and don't forget to go to indiefilmacademy.com and subscribe to our newsletter um, and we'll send you a free ebook okay let me get started with the interview my first question to luke was about his background in video and filmmaking and how the group from newman films came together i've been into to video uh since i was a kid my parents had an old uh, VHS camcorder that I used to mess around with and make movies with my friends and, you know, my siblings and stuff like that. Um, and didn't really ever start to take it seriously until like my mid twenties or so. And, um, that mostly just started out as weddings, um, local stuff, kind of toyed with the idea of going down to film school, you know, heading down to LA, doing all that stuff. Um, but my wife and I, you know, we, we do everything behind Newman Films. Um, we didn't like the idea of, you know, moving down to L.A., you know, new marriage and all that stuff. It just made a little more sense. And, you know, with uh, YouTube taking off and all that stuff, we kind of figured, why not try it just where we live? You know, this is a perfect time in, fil- you know, indie filmmaking to really do that. And one of the only, I mean, you, I think before you could probably make a career doing this stuff, but I think it was a lot harder. We didn't, we don't even live in a big town. We don't even live in, uh, we live in Oregon, you know, out in the, out in the country. And, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that wouldn't work. So, um, yeah, like I said, it it started out just as weddings and, and stuff like that. And then I think I uploaded a video just a, a random tutorial. I I, uh, um, I did something in Sony Vegas, like how to conform 60 frames per second to 24. And I just, I uploaded that, not really with no point to it. I just kind of thought, yeah, you know, I was actually looking for this tutorial online. I couldn't find it. So I figured that's the kind of tutorial that I'd like to see. And just kind of, you know, adding my take on that to the internet because I learned so much. I never went to film school. So everything I've learned is through other people providing information. And so, you know, just, I got the idea to upload this one tutorial and it got a lot of views and people, you know, they, they were looking for that kind of information and all that kind of stuff. And so that just kind of started it. It was like, well, you know, I might have some other ideas on stuff that I, I don't see online, you know? And so it was almost like, adding to the online encyclopedia uh, of filmmaking information. And and now, I mean, there's just every, you know, there's every single tutorials out there, all the information's online now. So it's, you know, it's different now than it was five years ago. And how were you learning all this stuff that you were putting online? Um, I mean, you know, a mix of tutorials that people had already done or just trial and error. Uh, probably 60, 40 with trial and error being usually the case. Um, and that's just, that's just the way I've always learned. I I wasn't a great student in high school or or college. I I dropped out of college and I, I've only ever learned things just through trying it myself and then failing and then realizing, Oh, that's the way it needs to be done. Right. Right. Now, did you start with the – was this kind of like after 2008 and all the DSLRs had already changed over or did you start yeah, before that? Yeah, it was, it was right after that. Um, 
I, I originally was using some like Sony Handycams, and then you know the 5D Mark II came out, and I was paying attention to all that stuff, but it was too it, it cost too much money. I couldn't afford it. And then um, I remember there was a commercial for the T2i, the Canon T2i, and that was the first one that was kind of within within my budget. Um, and, and the thing with that one too was, I mean, before then you had just being able to put any lens on it that you wanted was a big deal. Like, you know, in hindsight, the Canon T2i wasn't great, but it's like you could use all these different lenses. And so that was, you know, that, that brought so many different ideas to the table. And that's that was our first kind of jump into DSLRs was the Canon T2i, but only because it was the only thing we could afford at the time. Right. And you were shooting weddings at that, just weddings? And, and yeah, right at, videos right at, so? Yeah, right at first we were shooting uh, weddings, and um, we actually bought two Canon T2Is. My wife was the photographer, and then I was the videographer, and uh, we kind of did like package deals and stuff like that. And then the tutorial stuff, um, that was just you know kind of on the side. Just like I said, when it when I first started doing it, I had no idea what it was. I was just uploading videos, um, you know, for for 20 people or, you know, 20 subscribers or something. But, um, that has evolved definitely into being our, our kind of main thing over the past four years. Right. Now, do you watch some of those old videos and kind of cringe at them or do they, they hold up? Um, not, I mean, not really because I, I kind of look at it as just like, uh, my own path to just understanding video and the stuff that goes into it more like it's it's all it's funny in a way but at the same time back then and still now i don't really like to upload videos where i'm saying hey this is the right way to do things um it's more like here's something i learned through trial and error and here's the workflow on how i did it but i you know i, I it's never really claiming like oh i know what i'm doing because i don't you know, like I, I look at it like I have no professional training. So, you know, any of the things that I'm going to throw out there that are, you know, quote unquote educational are going to be more like I've found these to be true in my own workflow. If you like it, great. If not, you know, I, I'm not claiming that this is the way to do things. So in that way, I think watching old videos, there's not too many cringeworthy moments. I mean, there's a few, <laughs> obviously, but it, it's not too bad. Right. I still love your uh, your video about creating the giant rig. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I sh I've shown that to a few people, and they're they're like exactly the kind of people that like you know they parade in with like right. you know like a little teeny camera, and they just have all this stuff all around it, so they look like they're shooting with like an old Panasonic you know camera. Or something right. Like that. Well, I mean, you know, the the thing about that is like I'm I'm guilty of it too. It's like that's where the joke came from. Is you know we're all I think we're all guilty of it. So, yeah, that was a fun video. Now, um, are you primarily shooting? Are you still doing videos? Like, I mean, do you do weddings still and stuff like that? Or are you guys completely just doing the the products and, and Newman films, like soundtracks and things like that? Yeah, I mean, we we stopped. We haven't done a wedding for probably three years, right. and um, that mostly just stems like I didn't like doing weddings. They were uh, kind of stressful. You know, I mean, live event shooting is somewhat, if you're used to kind of having control over the lighting and what you're shooting, and then you, you shoot a wedding, it's just a completely different beast altogether. So it, it stressed me out quite a bit. Um, so I was happy to give that up. Uh, but we mostly <laughs> we mostly at this point, um, kind of focus on our own, yeah, our own products, our own videos. I mean, every once in a while we'll take on an outside gig. Um, but you know, I mean, at this point the YouTube thing has, like I said, evolved into something that it now kind of deserves most of our time. And, you know, if we're not building that, it's like, well, it's, it, we can at least use it as an avenue to do creative stuff, um, on our own as well. So it's right. been, it's been a good evolution over the years, I think. Right. Now, can you talk a little bit about Beacon and how that came into existence? Yeah. Um, so. And what, and what it is for people who don't know what it is. 
Right. Uh, the Beacon is a sci-fi web series, self-produced, um, with the idea being, you know, I wanted to make the transition from just like straight up tutorials uh, and being an educational channel to being more of like entertainment. I, I mean, I like filming narrative, creative stuff. Uh, but at the same time, I realized, well, the channel was built on people expecting educational stuff. So the beacon is kind of like my compromise to that of we're going to film uh, this sci-fi web series. And then to go along with it is going to be these in-depth tutorials that kind of look at every phase of production. So uh, to make that work, we kind of have to do everything ourselves. You know what I mean? So like writing the music, doing the special effects, cinematography, acting, editing, you know, all of it. If, if we do all of it, that leads to more interesting tutorial content, which, you know, that's what our channel is based on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it takes a while to do them just because uh, I want to satisfy, you know, my own uh, desires for doing creative stuff and making it high quality and that takes a lot of time by itself. But then, you know, also we have to film all this behind the scenes tutorial stuff. Um, like the first episode, I think, was seven minutes long. And the tutorial content ended up being around an hour. You know, so it's, you know, it's bordering on feature length content when you factor in the tutorial stuff, which we put equal amounts of time into. Right. Yeah, that's one of the things that that sticks out is like how well produced, you know, the 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 shorts are great, you know, but it's like the the production value on the behind the scenes is pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean that you know that goes uh, into like my wife and uh, um, our friend Pete, who's the actor. Like when we're filming this stuff, there's only three of us, and you know my wife films all the behind the scenes and. You know, it's it's kind of just like we all chip in and, and try to make it as high a quality as we can. But with three people, it, it obviously takes a while. Right. Now, do you find that you have to write stories and episodes? And, and really, the beacon seems to be created around the idea of something that you could do uh, with a three-person crew. You know, do you find that that's the kind of things that you do? Yeah, actually, the – like – when I first started having the idea for the beacon, it was much big. It was a much bigger idea. Right. Um, it was, you know, like, and, and I mean, you almost have to write that way. You can't write with limitation. Like, you know, you can only do this with three people. So you need to only write three characters, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, just based all around that. So the original idea was quite a bit different from what we're doing now. And we actually went out and we, we filmed quite a bit of this idea and got into the editing process and it was just like, you know, hit a dead end. And it was like, we can't do this with this budget. Uh, we can't, you know, the visual effects alone are just way above what I know how to do. <laughs> so, you know, halfway into filming the first episode, I kind of restructured the entire story. And at that point, I did kind of cater it to like, well, what can we do realistically with our budget, with what I know how to do? from visual effects and, you know, all that stuff without going totally broke. So, yeah, I, the the original idea is definitely still there, but it has been restructured a bit, you know, to work. And now that we're two episodes, like two episodes are done, we're working on the third episode. We're definitely on the path now of like knowing what it's going to take and knowing about how long it's going to take to film and so it's 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 different now than it was when we were filming the first episode. Right. How long does a typical episode take to shoot and do everything for, including the behind um, the scenes? Yeah, I you know it's it's tough because um, we we do it in our spare time. Um, oh. we, and you know, like I said, we don't take too many paid gigs, but we do from time to time, and it's kind of like, well, those take precedent over the beacon for now. And then, you know, um, the other, you know, the other people we collaborate with, um, they have jobs and they have, you know, their lives and stuff like that. So, uh, like the second episode, um, you know, we'd film, we'd, we'd get a weekend in and then we'd have a two week break and we'd do another weekend. So, um, and then, you know, reshoots and stuff like that. I, I would say 
from beginning to end, you know, five, six months. Um, but again, I, I think the process gets faster the more episodes we get done. The first episode, I think, took a year. Second episode took about six months. And just the way this third one is written, I, I see this one only taking a couple months. Right. Do you own the space outfit? Uh, yes, and, you know, and that was a that was a big like the, in the first episode we didn't own the space outfit and we had to rent it and it was ca- kind of expensive so you know that was tough it was you know the first time we had to kind of schedule everything schedule the spacesuit and you know all this different stuff and lineup schedules uh, and that after after filming that one we were just like well it's going to be a lot easier if we own these costumes so. Uh, for basically from that point on we we've tried to just buy everything outright so that that fits within our shooting schedule is there any sort of like copyright or anything with using costumes i mean i, I don't i don't know how all that works but i mean like if people are trying to shoot something similar and they go to a costume shop can they use that in a narrative film and like have the right well, or is that something they have to create themselves i mean you, you know like the costumes we have in the beacon they're kind of custom made so um, I mean, you could you could go to the guy that built that made the spacesuit and have him make something similar. But uh, yeah, I don't I actually don't know about copyrights. I'm right. assuming like <laughs> I'm assuming you know. Well, actually, I think it depends on on how you're filming it because you see you know Star Wars parodies online where they're using stormtrooper costumes and and I'm assuming it just depends on how you release it. And where it's going to be released to. So. Now the gear that yeah, you I guys have, use. Are, are, sorry, I didn't sorry. Want to interrupt. No, go ahead. Go ahead. The are you using your own gear? I mean, do you own all that, or do you have to do you rent whenever you go out? You're shooting like on a what the red or something. Yeah, uh, we have the red dragon, uh-huh. and then we use the Panasonic GH4 for behind the scenes. And usually, the only thing gear wise we'll rent is lenses. Um, most of the beacon has been shot on anamorphic, uh, PL mount Kawa anamorphic lenses. And we found, uh, this, the trouble with renting lenses that I found is they're generally cheap, except you can't, people usually don't split up their sets. And I don't, I don't need a 40, a 50, a 75 and a 100 millimeter when I film. I, I usually stick to two focal lengths. Um, and I, I don't know why. Well, I, you know, for the beacon, most of the time it was a 40 and a 75 because I, I do like that wider anamorphic look. And then if I ever need to get in a little closer, the 100's a little too close. So I found the 75 was a nice in between. Um, so we actually found a rental house that does split up their sets, uh, gearhead camera rentals. And he, you can just rent one anamorphic lens and they're only like a hundred bucks a day. Uh, so that, that definitely helped us be able to, to use the lenses we wanted to use. And, and that was a big, uh, factor in the look of the beacon, I think. Right. Now you said a 40 millimeter, is that considered like different for film lens versus a photographic lens? Cause a 40 uh, in photographic n- wouldn't be very wide. Well, I mean, since it's anamorphic, it's actually uh, you're actually getting a tw- and it's a two x uh, squeeze. You're getting a twenty millimeter field of view. Um, I think uh, on the height you're getting a twenty millimeter field of view, and on the width you're getting a forty millimeter field of view. So it at- you won't see too many an- anamorphic two x lenses that are wider than I mean, you'll see a thirty five. But depending on the sensor, you know, if you have a larger sensor like the Dragon, the 35 might not even work. Um, so, yeah, with, with anamorphic, 40 is usually about as wide as you can go. Okay. Would you attribute shooting anamorphic? I mean, is that what's giving you that really kind of amazing film look that you guys get? Um, I mean, the one thing that I found with shooting anamorphic is and the same thing with the dragon like i don't believe at all that the camera can make that much of a difference in what you do right but 
when you do look through the LCD of the red and you ha- have an anamorphic lens on there, your mind automatically kind of just goes, hey, that looks like a movie. If that's, you know, your subconscious because you watched a lot of anamorphic stuff in the 90s as a kid, that could be it. But that my mind automatically just goes, wow, that looks really cinematic and I'm not, I'm not even doing anything. So naturally that's the lenses and the camera. Um, but in, you know, with that, I think it does kind of force you to up your game a little bit to where, you know, you see this, this beautiful image and your mind just starts going with all these like, Oh, this kind of shot would be cool. You know, and, and your mind starts to work a little more creatively for it. And that's probably just me personally, but that's what I find is, is not so much anymore. But when I first started using those anamorphic lenses, I was getting really excited just with the look. Right now, it, when you're looking at the image, I mean, is it compressed or is it all like, does it all figure it out for you so you can look through the view? Yeah. The, the, uh, the red LCD does figure it out. It, it, it crops it. Um, and then when you get into post, that's not the case. So you bring it in, you bring it into, I actually, uh, premier pro might, might, um, might make them the correct aspect ratio automatically, but I do a lot of work in after effects. And so when I bring it in, the image is stretched two X tall and it's, you know, it's like a four by three type of image. So you, you definitely have to do some post work to get it looking right. Right. And, and you can also shoot, I was watching one of your um, tutorials about shooting anamorphic on a GH4. So, so maybe people who don't have the budget for a dragon, I mean, what, what would be the, would you recommend shooting anamorphic on a GH4 as well? Yeah, I mean, I really like that they did that, that they unlocked a 4x3 and a, even a 1x1 one one, um, recording mode because it does allow for anamorphic shooting. And you can shoot anamorphic on a normal 16x9 sensor. It's just you probably don't want to use a 2x lens, which is the really, really tall image. You want to use like a 1.33, which there's plenty of those lenses out there. And even the, um, I think, Letus and uh, uh, SLR Magic have fairly affordable adapters that you screw onto the front of your normal lenses and it gives you that anamorphic stretch. Um, and with a 1.33 stretch uh, on a normal, like just sensor shooting 16 by nine, that stretches down to, to that cinematic aspect ratio. So it depends, you know, it depends on what camera you're shooting on and that usually determines what kind of anamorphic lens you want to choose. Okay. Now, how, how do you learn all this stuff? I mean, how does one know, like, all this stuff about anamorphic? And, I mean, is there a big book that you have somewhere? No, it was <laughs> it was really confusing at first. Like, I, I didn't understand a lot of it. But, again, with trial and error, it just I, – I learned a ton when I just tried one out. You know, when I, when I put an anamorphic lens on and I took it through to post, I was like, oh, okay, that's what the, the stretch factor means because I – I need to stretch it this much to get it looking right. So a 2x lens, you stretch the the height of the image down to 50%, you know, and and because that's the 2x number right there. Right. Um, and just using them a couple times kind of made had it made a lot, a lot more sense. Now, when you're shooting, what is what is the huge difference between say shooting with? I mean, obviously they're huge differences in size, but say for like the, the photographic quality of shooting with a GH4, which is obviously under 2000 bucks. And then something like the dragon, what's like the huge difference there? Um, the colors and the dynamic range. Like for me, I, I don't care too much about the difference in resolution. I don't need 6k. And when I film in 6k on the dragon, I just, I scale it down to 4k at the end. Right. Uh, but the colors and the uh, dynamic range are just – that's the thing that surprised me the most with the Dragon is it's actually kind of hard to overexpose your highlights. Like we'll be out filming in the bright sun and we're in a forest and, you know, above the tree line you can see the bright sky. And with the GH4, it's just white. Like you, there's nothing there. Right. But with the uh, the Dragon, you have this very subtle – 
roll off and then it's not quite white it's just like a you know it's like a very off white and it just it makes all the difference in the world the you know most people probably won't notice but um that that has always stuck out to me and then the colors uh it just doesn't take much to get the dragon image looking looking cinematic and i have enough time with it that um you know, I have a couple LUT files that just like I know how to make that image look good in post. Whereas the GH4 takes a lot more time, uh, and it's taken a lot of time just to get the camera profile right, and then have a corresponding LUT file in post that I'm comfortable with. Right. But I'm pretty comfortable with the GH4 at this point. Right. Now, when you um, would you compare it to like shooting in HDR or something? Is that like a raw file that's coming out? Or is it like a of the of the dragon? Yeah, uh, it's a, it's compressed raw. Okay. Um, and I mean, you have a lot of flexibility. You know, you can you can change the gamma. You know, you can make it a log profile in post, or you know, not. You can change the white balance. I mean, you have a lot of flexibility. So it's almost like I mean, you know, it makes you a little. A little lazier, I guess, but you know, you, it, with, with such a small production like ours, it allows me to focus on different stuff. Like I don't have to spend so much time uh, thinking about the camera. I just, I basically look at the histogram and I'm like, okay, if it's, if it's, I know where it needs to be, and that's it. Let's roll. Right. Now, what, what do you kind um, of? Where, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, as we're with the GH4, like you really have got to you have less dynamic range to play with so if if you have something overexposed you need to slap on a, a nd filter you, you know you really need to work a lot more to get that image looking right on the gh4 mm -hmm. now you mentioned working with LUTs. what what is the um i want to go into more detail about that but can you talk about what your like Say you're setting up for a scene and you're setting up for you know to shoot something. What what are the things that you do to your camera? What kind of settings do you have and and um, what what do you do to make sure you're you're getting everything exactly the way you want it? Um, you know it's it's tough. It's kind of like a fly by the seat of your pants deal, where uh, you know it 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 generally is. Um, well, I mean, like I said, with the dragon, it makes it so easy that I don't find myself putting too much thought into that. I, I think more about the camera movement, you know, and the composition than I do at camera settings. I mean, definitely when you get a new camera, that's what your mind is is focused on. But I think the place you want to get to with your camera is where you're not thinking about that stuff. You know, when you're when you're comfortable with the camera, that's when you're not thinking about the settings and what you need to do. To get the image right, you're just you know that by heart, and you're focusing on other stuff now. Do you do any sort of calibration, or do you just kind of say, okay, I can if if I've got the color balance or things like that, I'll just figure it out in post? Yeah, I mean, as sad as it is to say, there is a lot <laughs> of that mindset of like, yeah, I'll I'll be able to fix a lot of stuff in post, and. You know, if I'm on a job where I'm just a DP, my mindset might change. But something like the Beacon, when it's like, you know, we're we're doing all these different things and doing BTS, it's kind, of, it's it is a nice luxury to have to just kind of know that. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect right now. I spent two minutes setting up the the shot, and and now anything that's kind of wrong with it, I can fix later on. Now, in terms of LUTs, do you um, can you explain, just give an overview of what LUTs are for people who are kind of just getting started and um, how that works in camera and also in post production? Yeah, uh, a LUT is it stands for lookup table, and it essentially uh, you apply a file uh, to your shot and post. I mean, a LUT is basically just a file, uh, and they come in several different file formats. And you apply them to your shot, and they make adjustments uh, like contrast, saturation, and all that stuff. Um, so they're essentially, you know, color grading presets. But the nice thing is they're not specific to, you know, any one software. That they, they work for pretty much every um, editing software. And uh, 
you know, I mean, a, a big part of LUTs that, that I like to use is um, I, I create a lot I for specific shots. You know, like for the beacon, I have just folders of LUT files that um, I'll use for any one scene. You know, some of them might be specific to a certain time of day and lighting style, and some of them might just be more basic, uh, you know, like contrast and saturation boosts or um, reductions. And I definitely stack LUT files on my shots. You know, sometimes I'll mix, you know, four to five of them on any given shot. Right. Now, is that something... So you're doing that in the camera as well as doing it in After Effects, or is it totally for just post-production? It's totally... I mean, with the Dragon, it's totally in post-production. They say they're going to be able to... Or they say they're going to add LUT files in camera at some point, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, and very few cameras have that. I wish they did, because I would love to, you know be looking at what my color graded shot is going to be while I'm filming. Uh, and there are ways to do that, but at this point that's, I don't, I don't do that. I just, it's all a post-production workflow thing. And you create those in after effects. I actually create those, uh, in a third party software. I don't remember. It's, I think it's called 3d LUT creator. Um, and I basically how I take a still, you can take a still image so I'll uh, I'll make a still image of my shot or or my scene, and then you take that into this program and you and you can create the LUT files in there. Okay, and that's for a lot of people that don't know. That's really what gives certain you know certain styles to different filmmakers. So you guys have one for right. you know all all different kinds. I mean, you guys that's one of the products you sell is is LUT files that you can you know make it look like Wes Anderson or make it look like Right. Yeah, and that was actually um, the Blockbuster LUTs. Um, that's a product that we spent quite a bit of time on. And the idea behind that was just like try to – well, the process for creating those was actually pretty fun. Uh, we I'd take a still from a Blockbuster movie. It's so like let's say Wes Anderson. Took a still from a Wes Anderson movie, and then we tried to recreate – that still, so let's say, I think uh, one of them was from um, Moonrise Kingdom. Is that the name of it? I, I can't remember because we, yeah. <laughs> we, we titled all the LUT files to be close, so ours was Sunrise Kingdom. <laughs> right, okay. So I don't remember what the name of the actual movie was, but you know, we tried to recreate a scene from that Wes Anderson movie with all these different cameras, and then I would sit there and, and get the LUT files from each camera to match that Wes Anderson look. So, you know, it's kind of tough because some people, they'll they'll buy the LUTs and they'll apply them to footage and they'll be, you know, they'll email or, or something and say, like, this doesn't look anything like Wes Anderson. And my <laughs> response is usually like, well, okay, you got to understand how they're made first. And then that, that kind of reveals you need to have your before image looking kind of like a Wes Anderson movie. So there's so much... There's so much stuff that goes into a Wes Anderson shot that, you know, an underexposed shot inside of your house isn't going to look right when you apply the LUT. So, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, there's a certain amount of um, there's a certain amount of work that has to go on <laughs> on the person's side that's actually going to use the LUTs. Now, when you're on location, I want to talk for a second about shooting in some of the, you know, one of the big things that you notice about just about all of your um, films is they they have amazing locations. Um, yeah. And how do you go about shoot? First of all, how do you go about finding the right locations? And also, how do you plan for shooting in those locations in terms of where the sunlight is and all that? Um. So for the I mean, for the beacon and for most of our stuff, we try to make it. Um, we try to film it within our state of Oregon, you know, like we're, we're proud of our state. Uh, we like traveling around it. Um, and you know, there's so many locations, especially on the West coast that might be a little more epic, but we, there's a lot of variation in Oregon. So part of it just comes from, um, we like hiking and we like, you know, going out in nature and exploring. So we, sometimes we'll just stumble 
across locations. That's like, oh, this is this will be a great location for the beacon. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of it just has to do with loving being outside, being in nature, and uh, and exploring. And, and uh, you know, I'll spend a lot of time looking on Google Maps um, if it's a location I haven't been to. I'll uh, go to Google Maps and then get it to where the photos of the area show up. And I'll just kind of like hover around different areas of the state. And, you know, sometimes you'll find stuff that is off the beaten path and we'll go and check it out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think I think if uh, it was 20 years ago and I had to take just a job in the industry, it would probably be a location scout. I, mean, I think that's that's a lot of fun. Right. So do you do you have to plan like you can't just arrive at like twelve o'clock in the afternoon and say okay let's start shooting I mean do you can do you have to like sit around and wait for the sun to be in the right area I, you know I mean part of it is that but but like I said with a small crew I mean w- sometimes we just have to make it work you know sometimes we only have a weekend and unless we want to take a year to film the episode it's like well we gotta we got to double up and we got to go to like three locations today and we really don't have any choice on the sunlight. So a lot of it is, you know, working with what you have, bouncing light, diffusing light and, and, you know, working in post-production again, like I said, you know, with the LUT files and all that stuff to get that look because we can't always rely on the perfect time of day um, with our, with our shooting style. Do you think it's better for filmmakers who don't have a high budget to maybe try to work with a better camera just so they don't need to hire so many people to manipulate lights and do stuff like that? I mean, not necessarily, because I, 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 I still think some of the stuff we did with the T2i looks good. Um, and with like the 5D, uh, I, I think a lot of it just has to do with, um, you know, not being a fr- or, or take you know caring about the image enough to to light a little bit. You know, I mean, when you're outside, you don't have a ton of control, but you can bounce light. You can you can diffuse light. That's not that hard. Um, and if you don't have somebody to hold the reflector, just uh, you know, put one up on a stand or, or you know, there, there's different ways you can go about it. Um, but no, I, I think. It's one of those things to where now that we are using a nicer camera, it definitely makes it easier. But that never really stopped us from trying to get a good image with a with a lower budget camera. Do you have any advice for using a reflector? <laughs> um, I mean, not really. Like when when we use, like I said, a a, um, a less expensive camera and you have less dynamic range, um, sometimes you need to bounce quite a bit of light like let's say you're in the forest you've got the sky in the background the the sky is just white and it's overexposing and you need to you need to get down you know you put some nd filters on and get quite a bit darker to even see that blue sky to do that you need to get quite a bit of light on your talent um and you know a lot of times that just means like reflecting putting them right next to a big sunbeam and just bouncing the light, you know, three feet from their face just to be able to expose the shot. Uh, and you know, that's the kind of stuff we would do. It's, it's, um, it's hard on the talent, you know, cause they, they're basically looking into the sun. Uh, but, but you know, I mean, there, you, you don't have to do that, but I, I kind of think like, well, that makes the camera look like it's not a lower budget camera because everything's exposed properly. And now with the dragon, like we, we we can just use a white fill. You know, we don't have to bounce sunlight so much. The, the dynamic range is always always kind of in check on that camera. So I can even draw draw a mask in post and bring up the exposure in that mask and you know fill in some light that way too. So it, it does definitely help. But I think it's better to learn learn to do it. Um, with a lower budget camera first, and then you'll appreciate uh, having the options in post to not have to worry about it. Right, and I, I bet Pete appreciates too not being like blinded oh, yeah. every day with the reflectors. Yep. As well. well, but he, he's a he's a photographer. Right. You know, he he does a lot of like 
uh, photography stuff and he knows i mean he he does it to his models too he he puts a bunch of bounce and fill on them so when when he's in front of our camera which is you know it's really the only time he acts is just for our stuff um you know he'll he'll kind of start to wince and i'm like no you know i've seen your pictures you put your models through this you gotta <laughs> suck it up <laughs> right now, what what gear can you kind of like not if you're going out and driving out into the middle of nowhere? What what is the gear that you just you know have to have with you that you feel you know kind of naked without? Need a reflector. Um, need some sort of camera movement. Like I I do not like just tripod shots. I need a dolly. Uh, we've been using a product called Ultra Dolly for years, and it's just. It's a little T, like a, a metal T that you put your tripod on and it has wheels on the bottom and then you use PVC pipe as your track. Um, and I, I really like having that. And then ND filters. ND, you, I mean, if, if I'm out in nature, yeah, I definitely need some ND filters. Right. Do you bring like lights at all? Do you, do you I mean, I remember you, you were showing how you shot a, a scene that was in a cave and, you said that you brought like a big battery pack and lights down there and everything. Can you talk about what, I mean, what kind of lights are you using and what kind of uh, battery pack that requires? Yeah. Uh, so that, that was for the beacon and, and, you know, just going out into nature to me is a little different than the beacon. Like the beacon, I, I want ha a little more of a cinematic feel. So that um, we just had some home Depot lights. Like one of them was a, uh, a spotlight, uh, a tungsten spotlight, and it was just in one of those Home Depot clamp housings. And uh, I'm trying to think. We had a, a little LED light. So I think we just had two, two maybe three lights, two LEDs and then that Home Depot light. And we powered that Home Depot light with this big backup battery that uh, they're normally used for computers, I think, Um and it la it powered that light for about 45 minutes. It was really heavy, and the we like you said we went into a cave and it was snowing out, and it was you know quite a hike from our truck to the location. Uh, so it was like it was worth it because I really enjoy I, I like that shot. That's one of my favorite shots. But we did have to carry you know a 25 pound battery, and it's just <laughs> it's awkward. You know, there's no easy way to carry it. Um, you know, it's worth it now, but while we were filming it, it was, you know, I was getting some grief for having to bring that out. <laughs> yeah. This can be a little hairy too sometimes to yeah, get around. Yeah. Um, now moving a little bit more into post-production, can you talk about your process for now when you're shooting these, do you like when, uh, like say Pete's doing an action sequence, do you look at that and say, okay, we're going to do a wide, then we're going to do a close up, then we're just going to do some you know, random B roll. And, and then you'll, I mean, do you, do you just kind of shoot a lot of stuff and then try to put it together? Or are you pretty much like, okay, I know exactly what we're going to shoot and, you know, edit it together. Um, I mean, I, it's definitely more of just kind of freestyle. Like, um, I like, I like not knowing exactly what I'm going to film. I could never do storyboards. I could never have a shot list. I mean, I can have a shot list, but yeah, you know, I, I generally know where the scene's going and what we're going to do. I just don't know the spe specifics. Sorry. I don't know the specifics of the scene uh, from a cinematography standpoint. And I think it helps that I edit this stuff because I'm thinking, I'm constantly thinking while I'm filming as an editor. Yeah, so, like, let's just take a sequence from the beacon. Like, Pete slides down this cement uh, incline and he shoots like four guys during the slide and then falls off a little like uh, drop off and, and lands on the ground. Uh, you know, while I'm thinking of that scene, I, I kind of envision each shot. And as we do it, um, I, I'm thinking of it as an editor. Like I, the beat is going to go like this and you know, there's going to be three quick shots and there'll be close ups. And then, you know, you'll need this shot of him sliding off. Um, so I think it helps editing and, and knowing about the editing process when you're filming. Now, when you, um, what do you, 
primarily use uh, for for post production? Are you on a Mac or are you doing PC? Or? I'm on a PC. Um, on a, right now, I'm on a laptop, uh, a gaming laptop, and it's it's pretty good. It's um, <laughs> it's fast. You know, I mean, uh, it's not great, but I mean, for it handles 4K. It handles 6K with the Dragon, so uh, it's fine for what I need. Uh, and I generally, <clears throat> I'll get into Premiere and I'll make my, I'll do my edit. Um, and with something like the Beacon, actually, it's a, it's even a, it's more complex than that. I'll do scene by scene, and I'll generally. Um, I'll work on a scene that's like two minutes and render those out as DPX sequences. Well, first I'll get the scene edited in Premiere, then go over to After Effects, color grade, do any visual effects, and then work on the audio in Adobe Audition, the music, all that stuff. And I'll almost make these little mini movies and render those out as DPX sequences and then piece the whole thing together in one Premiere timeline at the end. And EPX is is just a, a reference file for Premiere. No, it's a it's a it's a, an image file, but it's pretty lossless. It's a really high quality image file. Okay. Um, and you know, just going to YouTube, it's like I don't really mind losing a little something going to H.264 as long as I have that master DPX sequence. You know. For, for later on, burning the 4K Blu-ray when it comes out or something like that. Right. Okay. Now, so you do that, you put your edit together, and then at the very end, you grade the whole thing again? Or? I use, that's that. Well, that's what I mean, is I usually like to grade as I go, and so that's kind of why I break it up into individual scenes. Um so I'll generally take a scene from start to finish. And so, you know, with episode two of The Beacon, for instance, I had 10 scenes or something in different folders, and they were all ready to go. Um, and I just find it a little easier to work that way because I like to see the grade as I go. I like to hear the finished audio as I go. Um, and if that timeline gets too big... With all those 6K files, it my, my system is going to slow down. So it's kind of like I can my computer can handle it, but I do have to kind of work around it a little bit. Um, and that's where that editing at, as individual scenes comes into play. Okay. Now the two things I want to touch on, you know, lastly are um, your your process for doing visual effects and also for scoring. Um, so what, I assume that the scoring come at the very end of, of the whole process after visual effects and everything, or do you leave a space there and you say, okay, there's going to be this great, you know, cool asteroid scene? Um, well, the scoring, I, I sometimes will get ideas for music first. Um, and I've been into music longer than I've been into video. Uh and I, I honestly like writing music as much as I like doing anything on the video side. Um, so sometimes, I mean, for the beacon, I wanted to, I wanted to get in touch with what the character is doing. So my wife and I would actually hike out to the locations we were going to film, and I'd bring my laptop and a little, a little MIDI keyboard, and I'd write some of the music out there. And M Marika would sing the vocals and we'd record all this stuff out in nature just to kind of be in the shoes of the character. Um, but that was before we had shot anything. So um, writing the music actually started to give me ideas of, of a scene and of individual shots. So that that's the song that's in the intro of episode two from when he's in the spaceship, when he leaves the spaceship and then he's standing up on these, this rock cliff uh, that whole sequence was kind of, uh, I got the ideas for those from the song. So, I mean, what is the process of, of like composing for film? I mean, I, I really know nothing about the, do you have to, to time it out perfectly? Are you sitting there with like markers of when you have to hit this beat and hit this, you know? Well, I mean, tradi traditionally, you know, a composer will write their music to the locked visual. So they, de they definitely have to 
to work that way. You know, you have to work the music around the visuals. But with the way that, that I write and coming up with the songs first, it's the other way around. My edits are usually cut to the timing of the song. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, um, and that's not always the case. I mean, the second episode of The Beacon, for instance, the whole intro was cut to a song that was recorded before the visuals. And then after that, I didn't have any music for some of the scenes that we filmed. So I just kind of filled in those spaces with new stuff. And at that point, I wrote in specific things. So um, it just kind of depends. You know, sometimes for episode one of The Beacon, I wrote a bunch of songs that I had originally, like I said, um, the idea for The Beacon was originally something totally different. And so I wrote songs for that stuff, and then those songs just didn't work. And I probably could have tried to make them work, but, um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And you, you also sell music, right? I mean, you can, like, buy, buy the soundtracks you've already created and put them, put, put them into your own films, right? Right, yeah. We do, we do some royalty-free stuff, and that all stemmed, um, you know, I, I before I did any of that, I would just, use songs from movies that I liked or, you know, and I would get copyright notices and all this stuff. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, then I used, started using, uh, video copilots pro scores and I, you know, I used one of their songs in a video and then I heard that same song so many other places that I was like, man, it kind of, <laughs> kind of just makes you think of that other video when you watch our video because it's the same song you know that's how big of a factor music plays so that that idea was just like you know i i want to try writing stuff i I don't think it's too hard i mean even if it's just one note you know at least it would be our one note to to this thing so you know midi samples um they've come a long ways and the technology behind them has come a long ways whereas you know in the 90 early 90s the MIDI technology was like the Super Mario theme, you know, <laughs> right. really just n- right. not sounding great. To now, um, you know, they record full orchestras from all these different mic positions, and they have them play each note in, you know, a ton of different articulations. So it's like if you kind of understand the computer side of things, and that takes a while, um, and if you fork out the money for the good samples, it really is – uh, it's an amazing experience and you have your hands on so many different instruments and they all sound so good that uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And just the idea that sitting here on a little MIDI keyboard, I have these sounds that sound pretty close to the real thing. I mean, I doubt even, you know, even uh, one of the best violinists in the world could tell the difference between a real violin and then a a sample violin with somebody that knows how they're how they're using the samples because they're technically the same thing they're recording all these real instruments so so what it's definitely what, what, a fun I mean uh-huh. yeah what are you using well, Pro Tools a, uh, I you I used to use Pro Tools and I actually I still do for most of it and then um, lately I've been using Sony Acid Pro and uh, it's actually it's it's only like ninety nine bucks or something like that. Um, whereas Pro Tools, I, I don't know, they're five six hundred or something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, and the thing I noticed is if you know something about editing video, uh, that that goes a long way. Um, the tips you've learned as being a video editor, a lot of it translates into doing music. Um, just the interface dealing with like tracks and, you know, adjusting the tracks to the timeline, like snapping. Um, there's a, just a lot of different things, importing, exporting, all that stuff. Um, there's obviously some specific things you need to learn, but if you have, you know, any musical talent at all, I, you know, you should be writing music for your, you know, if you, if there's really no reason you shouldn't at this point, it is really easy. Like I've always said, I don't think I could play live any of the songs I've ever written. (laughs) And that's, it's sad. You know, I've talked to, I've talked to guys that have made their living being like studio musicians. And I tell them like, Oh yeah, you know, uh, like I'll play them a song or something. They're just like, wow, 
And I was like, you know, I, I don't deserve any credit because all I did was just hit a bunch of keys on the keyboard and then go through with my mouse and, and create this piano piece just by changing the individual notes with my mouse. And it really doesn't take any musical... It, it's more like 80-20. You need... 80% computer know-how and 20% musical know-how. Now, what do you mean you change it with your mouth? Well, uh, so, I mean, you can you can hit a bunch of keys on the keyboard. Uh, you, you, let's say you have a piano sample loaded. You could, you could just take your elbow and go down the keyboard. Then you could go in with your mouse and adjust oh, your each mouse. of those I thought, notes. I thought you were saying mouth. Right. Like, okay. No, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it, okay. You go in with your mouse and, and just create this, you know this masterpiece of a song line that you could never play live and you're just doing that with a computer and your mouth and your mouse. Right. And those are just yeah, samples that you've recorded and, and you know, right. Okay. And I, you know, somebody, somebody got a, a really talented piano player and they rented a really nice studio space and they have really nice microphones and they just have that piano player go through and play each note on the piano once and then maybe some chords and, and they do all these different recordings. So really it's just, you're using your keyboard to trigger wave files. That's really all it is. Now, when you say you work with Sony, is that are you buying additional VST instruments from other places, or, or does it kind of right. give you everything that you already need? Yeah, right. I mean, Sony is where I do all the compiling, but uh, the samples I, I'll use um, 8DO. Uh, I use a lot of their stuff. I use Project Sam, um, East West. Let's see, East West, Project Sam, 8DO, those are the main three. Right. And, you know, some of them are, have better sounding strings, some of them have better sounding horns, some of them have better sounding percussion. Uh, one of the samples that I just got recently is actually Hans Zimmer. Um, it's all his samples from, like, The Dark Knight. Oh, wow. And all this stuff. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and I actually use, use some of that in the beacon, um, that the, the second episode, that first song, you can hear some of these, some of that percussion stuff is the Hans Zimmer samples. And there's like, you can use that in any production. I mean, is that copyright free and everything? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he, he used them for all those movies and then he decided just to make a product out of it. Yeah. Pretty cool. But then that came out after you guys did the Batman stuff though, right? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now um, talk l talk to me for just a little bit. I'm, I don't want to, you know, we're going a little over time, but um, about uh, your visual effects work because one of the striking things also about the Beacon is, you know, all of these shots of space, and you've done some really, you know, thorough tutorials about all that. But could you just talk a little bit about the process of, of making those? Yeah, um, <clears throat> all of it's done in After Effects. Um, which, you know, I mean, a big, a big part of my visual effects knowledge is video copilot. And I think that's the case with a lot of people online that do visual effects. Um, and they have a series of tutorials. that's just like basic after effects, like just here's what you need to know. And I think it's five tutorials, but you know, I just, I spent a day watching those and just from there, started to try different stuff out. Um, and then I use, for 3D stuff, I just use their plugin Element 3D. Um, and lately, I've been, I mean, for episode three, uh, which we haven't filmed yet, um, the, the requirements for visual effects are a bit more advanced. So I've been, that's kind of why it's been taking a while, is I'm actually learning quite a bit of new stuff um, on creating models. Um, creating models and, um, you know, getting realistic lighting and all, it's a little more advanced stuff that will definitely be part of the tutorials for episode three. But, you know, at this point it hasn't been anything too crazy. It's just basic knowledge of after effects and then basic knowledge of, uh, the video copilot plugin element 3d. And I mean, if you have those two things, you take two days to watch tutorials on that stuff. Anybody could be it the level that I'm at is it's really, it's not too complicated. Like you get into the, the 3d stuff, the 3d software and, um, that stuff gets really complicated. Um, I actually looked into game creation a little bit for episode two. Um, 
the opening sequence of the Beacon episode two where he's in the spaceship, that's actually a level I was working on. I was working on a game, like a video game level. And, you know, like there's a software called um, Unreal. Or it's like Unreal Engine 4 Development Kit or something. Um, created the, the spaceship level, and then you can go through there with a, a digital camera and do all this different stuff. So that's that's actually how the visual effects were done for that episode. And I'm actually working on a tutorial for all that. That's, there's just a lot that goes into it, so it's taken some time. But that's all more advanced stuff. I mean, After Effects is really powerful, and then that Element 3D plugin, just for what it does, it's really amazing. Now, the same thing with that. I mean, if a filmmaker wanted to come in and try to shoot his own, you know, Star Wars or something and, and wanted to use Element 3D, what do you know if they could do that? I mean, is that something that you're – are you producing stuff that you can, like, take out of there and, and like, it belongs to you after that? Or – yeah, I mean, you know, anything that you do in that sense is is fair game. I mean, Video Copilot even provides, you know, models and stuff like that. But, it, you know, like if you buy a 3D model from TurboSquid.com, I mean, part of that is you can use that in your own productions. Um, and, you know, I think um, for Star Wars, you know, I mean, that's obviously a... There's probably a lot of copyright stuff there, but if it's just fan fiction, I think it's usually a fair game. No, I mean, I don't mean actually making Star Wars. I just mean it, it seems like, you know, the technology has advanced so much. I, I've always, I keep expecting to see all these movies coming out with visual effects and everything, but it just hasn't really happened. You know, there's a couple of fan things out there and, and shorts, and but you haven't really seen somebody really take the technology and kind of like go crazy with it. You know? I mean, yeah, I mean... Well, that's one thing that I wanted to try and do with the third ep- that, that I'm trying to do with the third episode, of The right. Beacon, is um, is taking what After Effects and Element offers and trying to replicate some higher end stuff. Uh, so, I mean, one of the things for episode three is is character duplication. Um, you know, we have one. Uh, spacesuit like one you know kind of like it's like the halo the halo master chief suit we only have one of them uh, and to to create an army of guys it's like well you, you definitely need to get into visual effects and um if you want to keep it 2d you know you you can do green screen or you can do you know some some in-camera tricks but if you want to get a little more creative with it it's like you need 3d models so that's what uh there's some new techniques out, and I don't want to give too much away, but um, to create 3D models and then to use them within After Effects to kind of do some stuff to create CG armies, you know. So that's kind of that's what I've been looking into. That's what I've been working on, and, and that is I don't know if it can handle it. I don't know if After Effects can handle it. I'm not at that point yet, but um, it'll be cool if it does work out. So you would try to import your own models into Element, is that right? Yeah, and then Element has built in like duplication stuff, so you can you know you import one model and then you say, okay, now create two thousand of these guys and spread them <laughs> out over spread them out over the screen and it's like a particle you know make thing right right yeah. So, yeah 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 so you basically do a particle system and then you make you know give them a little variance in size and and then also you know I'm gonna want to an- animate them a bit too so that's I mean, that's a whole different thing that's just a rabbit hole, learning so much stuff and hitting dead ends. But, you know, I think I've found a a way to make it work in After Effects. Right. And I don't think a lot of people realize sometimes that a lot of, like, that that can be done with green screen. Like, I saw a thing that Gareth Edwards did not too long ago where he was showing how he created this giant battlefield or whatever for, like, Genghis Khan or whatever, and he just had a 100 of the same, like one guy doing like different movements in front of a green screen. And then he just took that into a composite, like I guess after effects is what he uses. Right. Yeah. We, we actually did that. Yeah. We've done, I mean, we've done that a few times and the, the downside is just that you can't, you have to stick to 2d moves. You, you know, it's either, well, and then one thing we're doing with the beacon is we're incorporating motion control dollies. So, 
it it is that same 2D idea, but if you can replicate the same camera move over and over and over at the same speed, you know, and which what that's what motion control is, then you can get into some camera movements where you have multiple people. Um, so that's something we're going to be doing for the closer up shots, you know, and then mixing it in with the CG models and stuff like that. That's pretty hardcore, isn't it? The the motion control does that like does that match yeah, it up? Yeah, I mean up? it's yeah it's it's not too bad. I mean you just you basically go into the the motion control menu and say I want to, I want the dolly move to be this speed and then I want the pan tilt move to be at this speed. Then you just do that same move five times and then you know you have your actors doing five different things and just try to not have them overlap. But I wouldn't even do. I don't. I, we're not even going to do green screen. So it's just literally drawing masks and After Effects to make it work. If there are characters that need to overlap, then you do green screen. Right. Yeah, I remember seeing that in the the Back to the Future movies when <laughs> that was like the big thing yeah. they did there was. Right. Um, yeah, and that stuff. I mean, you know, it's tried and true. Right. Now um, I have my last two segments, uh, okay. and then I will leave you in peace. Um, okay. So the the last segment, uh, the, well, my second to last me- segment is called the time machine, and basically, okay. the idea is, what would Luke Newman of today tell Luke Newman of say ten years ago, or when you were first starting out? What what advice would you give to yourself? Well, ten years ago, I was in college for something I didn't like, so. Doesn't have to be specifically just, ten years, but you know, younger Luke Newman. Yeah, to the younger filmmaker, and not a baby. <laughs> you know, like just yeah. fast forward. Um, I would say, uh, just focus on stuff that excites you. You know, like, um, trying to do stuff that you think other people will like, or even having that idea in your head, it usually doesn't work because. For whatever reason, I think creative people don't put – they feel like it's not their 100% their thing. And so if there, there's any inkling of doing it for somebody else or like, oh, I think this could be – I think people might like this. Or I think, you know, if it's not true to who you are, then you won't put 100% into it and it just won't do what you want it to do. So, you know, I mean I, I did a little bit of that early on like – Oh, I think this video could get views and that never works. You know, right. so it's like, yeah, just if something sounds interesting, just do it and you know, people have subscribed to the channel, they'll probably like it too because they like your channel. So, I, I you know, a lot of it I think just comes from living life and discovering who you are and growing up, you know? So, it's less filmmaking advice and more just life advice, just I think it's something everybody goes through. Right. Follow your authentic self. Right, right. right. And, you know, I mean, whatever that is, you know, try try to find what that is and then just follow it. Okay. Now, the, the other one is um, for people who are listening who want to go out and, and have something, um, you know, to to help them out on their way. What Can you name one book or movie or resource that has really been influential in your filmmaking career? Um, not really. I mean, it's just a collection. <laughs> it's just a collection of things. Right. My biggest thing, but again, this is, like I said, just me personally, is trial and error does a much better job of that than any book or movie or any, like, being passive in any way. Being active is the best way to learn. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I realize some people learn that way. Like there's some people that they need to learn by the books and, and that's just how some people learn new stuff. Um, I was never that way. And so that way never really, I never learned anything from it. Um, you know, so I, I think again, it just goes back to, Knowing what kind of person you are, knowing what you're looking for, um, but as far as books or, or movies, like that just didn't really fit with me personally. Right. Did you have any like favorite? So sorry if that. that. Um. Or do you have any? Yeah, I mean, I liked. 
Yeah, you know, it, it, I don't actually <laughs> watch. I don't actually watch that much stuff, and people always oh, yeah. kind of get offended by that. But it's like I, I, I like going out. I like I, I like being out in nature, and I, I like the the process of filmmaking more than I like watching filmmaking. But I mean, I, you know, I mean, I liked um, I liked darker. Com- I liked uh, Raising Arizona, uh, which was the Coen Brothers back in the day. Last of the Mohicans. Um, movies definitely shaped and had a bigger effect on me when I was younger. Um, but now, I mean, I I haven't been to the movie theaters in I think two years. Wow. So it's like I, you know, and it's not that I I don't like watching movies. It's just I'd much rather be out creating stuff. I think. Right. You'd rather make make them watch. Yeah. And I, I actually I watch a little more TV. Uh, you know, Netflix and all that <laughs> right. stuff. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'm more of a TV guy now. Okay. Do you have any plans? Do you, do you have the goal of at some point making like a normal feature or do you plan on doing more just the web series like you're doing it now? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really have any uh, desire to do a feature. I think, and that goes to why I don't watch that many movies. It's just I don't have the page. Like... I think I have ADHD. I, I don't think I could stick with a 90-minute idea for that long. My my ideas are always, you know, they're quick, and I want to. That's why the web series I think works better, is so that I can I can kind of work on a long-term idea, but in between that, do different stuff. Um, but I would definitely, you know, I think TV would be more up my alley than working on any sort of feature. Um, and we're actually exploring distribution for the beacon right now. Uh, we actually signed something a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but, um, you know, that, that's always been to me something I think I'd be better suited for. Well, Luke, man, I really appreciate you coming on and and talking to me. Um, thanks Thanks for having me. Can you uh, tell people how to get in touch with you and how to find you online and, all that good stuff. Yeah, uh, our YouTube channel is just Newman Films, N E U M A N N, uh, like the microphone. Um, and all, most of our stuff's on there. And then our website is newmanfilms.net. All right, man. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And that was my interview with Luke Newman of Newman Films. I want to thank Luke for coming on the show and being such a great guest. Next week, we'll be talking with Emily Best of Seed and Spark. That'll come out Tuesday, so that'll do it for today. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com. Zappity beep, boop, boop, wow.